Today's podcast is sponsored by the Expat Money Summit, a free online event being put on this October 2nd through the 6th by Mikkel Thorpe, host of the Expat Money Show. This is the largest offshore event in the world, and you're not going to want to miss it. So head over to expatmoneysummit.com. That's expatmoneysummit.com and get your free ticket today. Today's podcast is also sponsored by Privacy Action Plan. If you want to know how to protect your identity and money from thieves or how to stop big tech and the government from spying on everything you do, take back your right to privacy with Glenn Meter's Privacy Action Plan. Join their free webinar coming up on October 12th. Go to shiftradio.com slash action today to sign up. Every day, every day we're getting closer to a major stock market crash or a financial crisis or both. And I think the only thing that might derail this in the short run, of course, nothing is going to derail it in the long run. This crisis is inevitable and will happen. But uh, Powell is going to have to come out and, and do something drastic to change this narrative. Otherwise, this is going to happen. And, you know, whether it's tomorrow, the next day, the next week, it's hard to tell. But what seems apparent to me is that we're about to go over a cliff. Just don't know how much, you know, more distance there is between where we are now and the edge of that cliff. But, but we're going there. And what's going to push us over the edge is the rise in, in interest rates, the collapse in bond prices, which is continuing relentlessly. Now, this is not something that should be a surprise to any of my podcast listeners. I have been warning about this, not only in recent podcasts, but over the last several years, that this was going to happen, that interest rates were going to rise a lot more than the markets were prepared for. Not only rise a lot more, but stay higher for a lot longer. And that is what we're seeing now in the bond market. Bonds now are at their uh, highest yields uh, since uh, before the 2008 financial crisis. If you look at the yield today on a 30-year treasury, it closed at 4.7%. Now, that's still a very low yield. But again, we haven't had yields this high since the 2008 financial crisis, the yield on the 10-year is 4.56. Now, we're getting very close to 5%, which is still a low rate. But most people might not recognize this. But the last time the 10-year Treasury yielded more than 5%, it was 2001. And Um, the the yield got to like 5.2 or 5.3. So it barely got above 5%. We are almost there. Now, there's a big difference because back in 2001, I think the national debt was 7, 8 trillion. Now it's 33 trillion. We have a lot more debt now than we had back then. So this is a much bigger problem, a 5% 10 year. I mean, we're not there yet, but at the rate we're going, we will be there soon. And what nobody seems to appreciate in the financial media is they are looking at the the, the beginning of the end of this whole phony economy because the economy is built on a foundation of cheap money. It's not just the economy. It's every facet of it. The government, the deficits, the, the government budget is built on cheap money. And it's not just the federal government that's been gorging on this cheap money. A lot of the state governments, municipalities, they've all issued a tremendous amount of debt over the last 15 years. That's about how long interest rates were at zero, except for the last year. Again, remember, what was everybody saying when money was cheap? Great time to borrow. Take on debt. It's cheap. Borrow. Everybody borrowed because it was so cheap. And what was I saying for years? This is a mistake. 
I said, just because it's cheap doesn't mean you should do it. My analogy was, should you do heroin if it's free? Oh, look, I can get all that free heroin. How can I pass that up? You know, no, just because it's free, it doesn't mean you want to inject it into your body because eventually it's going to cause a problem. And that's exactly what's happening now. I knew that all that, you know, cheap money would come back to bite the people who borrowed it because eventually interest rates would go up and the debt would still be there. And then what would they do? Well, we're going to find out because it is a disaster in the making. You know, I looked at the yield now on a mortgage. It's now at 7.9%. We're almost at 8. I was predicting this. I was calling for this to happen. You know, there are a lot of people when the yield on the Treasury bonds just got up to 4%. Oh, this is a great buy. You got to buy these bonds. You know, a lot of these bond investors, oh, these are great yields. It's a great opportunity. Buy the 10-year bond. You know, you can get a yield. It's all the way up to 4%. And I was saying, well, what's so special about 4%? That's not a good yield. That's horrible, especially where the inflation rate is. But the whole basis of believing that 4% was attractive was based on the last 15 years of 0% interest rates and the belief that 0% interest rates are just around the corner. That as soon as there's a problem, as soon as the economy slips, the Fed's going to go right back down to zero. And then if you're holding those long-term bonds, you're going to make a lot of money just like people have in the past. Well, it's not going to work this time. In fact, people who have been holding bonds, they're down about 50% on their money from the peak in 2000. Bonds are getting killed. Bonds are down more than stocks this year. In fact, I don't think stocks are down, uh, although they're down about NASDAQ, I think is now down 8.5% from its highs. But I think bonds are down maybe 10, 11% on the year. So minus whatever you, you, you got in interest, you're losing money on bonds on top of the worst year for bonds practically ever uh, last year. In fact, this will probably be back to back the two worst bond years in the history of bonds. And I said that. I said that last year. I said this would be another down year last year. All the people that were saying, you know, buy the dip in bonds, I said, no, the dip isn't over. It's going to be a lot worse. And in fact, bonds are likely to have another down year in 2024 because they're still not high enough. Look, the yield on a six-month treasury is 5.5%. We're still, even after this big rally, only 4.7% on a 30-year. That's not how a yield curve works. It's positively sloped. Now, yes, you know, usually at the beginning of a recession, you'll get an inversion of the yield curve where the, the long end would be below the short end. But under normal circumstances, when you're not in a recession and everybody claims that there's no recession, that we've got this resilient economy that may be a soft landing, but not a real recession. Well, if that's the case, the yield curve needs to normalize. So if, uh, if you can get five and a half percent on a six month, if you just look at the, the average premium during the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, up till 2008, if the six month treasury is at five and a half, and it's actually a little higher than that now, a 30 year should be seven, seven and a half at least. Well, we're, we're, we're at 4.7. We have a long way to go to get normal long term interest rates, except they shouldn't be normal. The yield curve should be even more positively sloped now. Because the difference between the yield on a 30-year treasury and a six-month treasury is almost an extra 30 years of risk. What is the risk? Well, let's just take default off the table, right? Assuming the government's not going to default. And, you know, who knows? I mean, it could default. But let's just forget about that. The real risk is inflation, that your money will be worth a lot less in 30 years. Now, if you're loaning the government money for six months, I mean, how much less could it be worth? I mean, even if you have 10% inflation, you know, over six months, that's only 5% that you lose. But if you have 10% inflation for 30 years, by the time you get your money back, there's nothing left. So when you have higher inflation, you need an even bigger premium 
to loan the money, government money for 30 years because you're taking 30 years of risk. Now, what are the factors that determine the inflation risk? It's the size of government deficits because the bigger the government deficits are, the more inflation that the government is likely to create. So when you have large fiscal deficits, you would expect to have a higher premium on longer term bonds. And and so to go back and look at what has historically been the average, no, not today when you have uh, a historically abnormal amount of debt, when you have $2 trillion budget deficits, as far as the eye can see, in fact, as far as the eye can see, the budget deficits go a lot higher than $2 trillion a year. In fact, after this quick break, I am going to bring up the national debt clock and show you a little trick I didn't even realize, but it gives you a little glimpse into the future. And it's not even the distant future, just a few years ahead to see how big these deficits are going to be. This October, join me at the Expat Money Summit, a free online event being put on this October 2nd through 6th by Mikhail Thorpe, host of the Expat Money Show. In addition to me, other confirmed speakers include Dr. Ron Paul, Doug Casey, Jim Rogers, and Mark Faber, plus international lawyers, offshore precious metals dealers, foreign real estate experts, and much, much more. By attending the event, you'll learn about how to find a safe place to live in the world, how to legally limit your tax bill, protect your wealth through offshore investment and banking, and how to get a second passport and more. This is the largest offshore event in the world, and you're not going to want to miss it. So head over to expatmoneysummit.com. That's expatmoneysummit.com to get your free ticket today. Right. Before I continue with this podcast, I want to remind everybody, either at the end of the podcast or maybe right now, don't forget to like and subscribe to this podcast. I I realize that I haven't been saying that, and just about every podcaster out there constantly reminds their audience to like the podcast and subscribe if they're not subscribing. And apparently, though, that really helps your algorithms and gets more people to uh, watch your, you know, your 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 uh, channel. And I definitely need more people. Uh, watching the channel so they understand uh, what's going on and and why this crisis that's about to happen was created by government and 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 the Fed and not some kind of natural flaw in the free market system. So I want to call everybody's attention to the U.S. National Debt Clock and anybody can go there. Go to usdebtclock.org. And what I never noticed before was up in the upper right, there's a little button called debt clock time machine and you can advance it into the future to see what the national debt clock is projecting the numbers are going to be so for the fun of it i did that and you can go to 2027 that's as far into the future as this debt clock goes and that's not that far away right this is 2023 it's almost 2024 so three years or so this is what it's going to look like if we haven't had a crisis between now and then, which we probably will. So according to this, the national debt will be just under $45 trillion. So that's $12 trillion higher than it is right now in about three years. So $4 trillion a year increase in the national debt. Now, if you look at what they project the interest will be on the national debt per year, at that point in time, it's just under $3 trillion a year in interest on national debt. Remember, I've been saying by the end of this year, it's going to be a trillion dollars a year. By the end of next year, it's going to be $2 trillion. Well, this national debt clock is now projecting $3 trillion in interest payments. Now, to put that in perspective, it's projecting defense spending at $917 billion. So we're going to be spending triple, triple the amount that we spend on defense, on interest on the national debt. It has Medicare at 2.3 trillion, Social Security at 1.8 trillion. None of those programs come close, well, I guess Medicare, not that far, 700 billion off, of interest on the national debt. Now, some of the numbers also are mind boggling, and I'm not sure how accurate some of these are because some of them don't make sense. But for total tax revenue for the U.S. government, they have just under $4 uh, trillion. 
with $3 trillion in interest. So that means they're saying that um, interest payments will consume 75% of all the revenue that the U.S. government has. I mean, is that even possible? But that's what they're projecting. If you look at uh, the budget deficits that they're projecting for 2027, it's almost $4 trillion a year. That's the, the deficit. $4 trillion. You know, now, I don't understand. They have, they have federal spending at $11.2 trillion, which doesn't make any sense because if they got $4 trillion in taxes and $4 trillion in debt, that's $8 trillion in spending. I don't know where they're getting the extra $3.2 trillion, so maybe there's some flaw in the program somewhere. I'm not sure. But you get the point here. This can't happen. This future is impossible. There's no way we could get away with this. So something has to happen between now and then to prevent this from happening. And it's going to be a, a crisis. See, what the uh, markets don't understand is that the entire foundation, right, that we've been living on is about to implode. It's in the process of imploding beneath our, our feet. Nothing works with normal interest rates, let alone high interest rates. You can't run these massive deficits with normal interest rates. In fact, even Janet Yellen, you know, remember when she was asked if she's worried about the debt, she said, no, I'm not because the interest rates are low. So who cares about the debt? All I care about is the interest payments. Well, look at the interest payments. Look what's happening. Why does she still not care about it? When she said that, I pointed out, well, interest rates are going to go up. It's inevitable. And so the problem is inevitable. But the government doesn't work uh, with normal interest rates. The stock market doesn't work. All the companies are levered up too much. The real estate market doesn't work with normal interest rates. I said that the home mortgages are at 7.9. We could be at 9%. In fact, I think it's likely we can hit 9%. If the Fed doesn't come in and say uncle on the inflation war, if, if Powell continues to act as if he's going to keep fighting inflation, we're going to have 9% mortgage rates by the end of this year. Now, that's like a tripling from where they were. How can the banks survive? The mortgage-backed securities are imploding. We got a small taste of it when we got the bankruptcy of a few banks earlier in the year, whether it was March or so, when uh, you know we, we got three banks, uh, the Silicon Valley uh, Bank or Signature Bank or you know those the, the banks that were lending to crypto, you know they, they went down. But I said at the time that what happened with these banks is a problem for all banks because they all loaded up on mortgage-backed securities and treasuries. Again, I don't think anybody other than me, because I've never heard, I never heard anybody saying that stuff, but I was warning for all the years that everybody was saying how great it was that Americans could refinance and lock in these low rates. I was the only one saying, yeah, but what about the banks? What about the lenders who are stuck with this paper? It's a it's a, a negative sum game. The borrower's gain is the lender's loss. I was saying, what happens when interest rates eventually go up? The borrowers are sitting pretty because they've got these cheap loans. The lenders are broke because they've got all these underwater assets. They own mortgages or treasuries that have collapsed in value rendering them all insolvent. That's why when I was talking on my podcast, people, you know, about, or people would call me up, should I buy a house? I would say, well, just make sure you get a 30-year fixed rate mortgage because at the end of the day, that's going to be your biggest asset, your mortgage, because it's going to be your bank's biggest liability. So all these banks are insolvent. We're about to see another wave of collapses. Now, of course, the banks will be able to, you know, uh, postpone the collapse by going to the Fed and giving them all their underwater mortgage-backed securities at par, right? So the the Fed's going to have to explode its balance sheet again. We're going to have to see a major reversal in quantitative tightening again, the quantitative easing, to prevent all of these banks from failing. But again, when the banks take this bad collateral 
to the Fed and get par for it, even though it may only be worth 50 or 60 cents on the dollar. This is only short term. The Fed is supposed to give all these securities back uh, to the banks and ask for their money back, right? This is like a short term thing. I forget the date that all these loans are due, but these are loans, right? The new window that they opened up to stave off that financial crisis earlier in the year, they put a Band-Aid you know, on a cancer. They said, look, you, we'll, we'll, we'll loan you par, even though your securities aren't, are worth a fraction of par, but we'll loan you the money for a year. Well, are the banks going to be able to repay these loans? Of course not. They don't want that collateral back. They'd, they'd immediately be insolvent. The reason they're not insolvent is because they dumped all that bad debt on the Fed. But the Fed is pretending it's going to give it back to these un- insolvent banks. But if it gives it back to the banks, they'll be insolvent. And so it can't. But the, it, when the Fed has to admit this, again, that's you know letting the cat out of the bag. But if it continues this, then the balance sheet is going to have to explode. But then in order to prevent all the banks that took advantage of this from failing, Powell is going to have to extend the maturity of these loans. Again, he's going to be extending them indefinitely because the banks cannot repay the loans without failing. And of course, if the banks fail, well, there's a financial crisis and who's going to bail them out? You see, if Powell is going to continue to fight inflation, nobody can get a bailout. The minute there's a bailout, you stop the inflation fight because inflation is how the Fed bails everybody out. They bail out banks or they bail out the economy of the government by creating inflation. Anyway, we've got another uh, commercial break and we'll be right back and I'm going to continue with this uh, conversation. Big Tech and Big Brother constantly know your location, all of your texts and what you are searching. They can even access the cameras and microphones that you already have in your house. And this is just the tip of an iceberg. Big Tech companies like Facebook and Google are some of the most profitable companies in the world, even though everything they offer is for free. That's because you are the product. The data they collect from you is proven to be their most valuable asset, and they use that data to manipulate you. It's easy to feel over overwhelmed. But the truth is reclaiming your privacy is a lot easier than you think. You just need to know where to start. Glenn Meter, an online privacy and security expert, helps people like you use simple techniques to protect their browsers, computers, smartphones from data thieves. Now, listeners of The Peter Schiff Show can get some of these tips for free in Glenn's upcoming webinar on October 12th at 8 p.m. Glenn will show you simple tactics and strategies anyone can use to fight back against mass surveillance. This webinar is made for non tech people. Glenn understands how complicated and overwhelming cybersecurity is for most people. You're not going to be left scratching your head. Glenn will carefully and slowly walk you through the basics of cybersecurity so you grasp exactly what he's saying instantly. And the steps he's going to give you to protect your privacy are very easy to implement. If you can send a text message or an email, you can apply what Glenn will teach you. So take back your right to privacy. Go to shiftradio.com slash action today and sign up for Glenn's webinar. That's shiftradio.com slash action. About the fact that the entire phony economy that the Fed has helped construct on a foundation of cheap money is imploding. And everything that's been erected on top of it is going to come tumbling down. Nobody can handle Uh, normalized interest rates. The government is going to have to level with the people and tell them, you know what, the party's over. We got to either massively raise your taxes or we got to slash spending. We can't keep spending all this money that we don't have. We can't keep giving people Social Security checks because they just take that money and spend it. You know, people on Social Security aren't working, right? They're retired, so they're not producing, but they're spending a lot of money. They're driving up prices. You want to cut back on inflation, you got to take that Social Security money away. Or you got to take money away from somebody else so that people on Social Security can spend it. So either you cut Social Security benefits or you raise the taxes of the people who are paying the Social Security taxes. So you got to raise the payroll tax or you got to cut Social Security. But the politicians don't want to do either one of those. 
and they didn't have to do anything for years because they could borrow the money instead. And the only reason they could do that was because interest rates were rock bottom. Well, they're not rock bottom anymore. They are normalizing and they're nowhere near where they're going to go. We still have a long way to go up. People are in denial here. Right? Again, they expect the Fed to cut rates any moment. How can they do that where, with inflation where it is? You know, by the way, oil was up again today. Oil is back to almost $91 a barrel. And this is with the dollar going up, right? Oil is still going up. And stocks, the Dow is down 400 points today. NASDAQ, an even bigger drop, down about a percent and a half. And oil still went up. Imagine how what's going to happen to oil if we get a bounce in the stock market. If the dollar falls, oil's going to just go straight up. We're going to go through 100. Oil prices are not going to stop going up because inflation has driven them up. Meanwhile, we can't sell any more oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. In fact, they need to buy oil from the, to refill the reserve. And they're going to have to buy it back at a higher price than they sold. It's going to be a lousy trade. The American public is going to get stuck with a loss. Now, maybe they won't even buy it back for a while. They'll just watch the price go up uh, before they have to try to uh, buy some of that oil back. But you can't cut rates. The markets don't get this. Yes, the Fed slashed rates to zero in 2009. In fact, it slashed from the 1% in 2001 after the financial crisis. It slashed from the zero in 2008. And then again in 2020 with COVID, everybody expects, okay, the Fed's going to slash rates to zero again. They can't do that this time. The only reason they got away with it is because inflation, the way it's measured, was under 2%. And Powell could say, well, we can print more money, we can do QE to stimulate the economy because we're underneath our inflation target. And since we need to get the inflation rate up to 2%, we can do this because now we kill two birds with one stone, we stimulate the economy, plus we push up the inflation rate so that we can get to our target. So quantitative easing, stimulus, the Fed conceded that those policies would push the inflation rate up because that's what they claimed they wanted. They wanted higher inflation. So that was the justification. But if we have a crisis now, if the markets crash and if banks start failing, but the inflation doesn't come down, how do you justify cutting rates? You can't because inflation is too high. You can't say, well, inflation is four or 5%, but we're gonna create even more of it to try to prop things up. That will just crash the dollar, uh, you know, send prices ballistic. In fact, I think that at some point soon, that's gonna happen anyway. I mean, right now, the dollar is rising because bonds are getting killed. Why, why should that be? Just because long-term interest rates are going up, that's not bullish for the dollar. I don't know if these algorithms have been programmed right to understand this. The reason that bond prices are falling is because people don't want to buy them, right? There's too much supply and not enough demand. People don't want U.S. Treasuries. Well, if they don't want U.S. Treasuries, they shouldn't want U.S. dollars either because that's what U.S. Treasuries are. They're future payments of U.S. dollars. And also, the reason that people don't want these bonds is because they can see all the inflation that is being created. Maybe they looked at the national debt clock and moved it up to 2027 and freaked out, right? The bond vigilantes that have been asleep for decades, you know, they're like Rip Van Winkle, finally waking up, you know, to reality and they're selling their bonds. Well, everything that makes bonds unattractive makes the dollar unattractive. If you're selling your bonds because you're worried about inflation, because the government's gonna have to print a lot of money to monetize all this debt, Why would you want to buy the dollar? No, you don't want the dollar. You want to get rid of the dollar. This is going to happen. But the the strength of the dollar is keeping gold from exploding. That's why gold is 1,900. Gold was down about 10, 12 bucks today. It should be a lot higher than 2,000, and it will be once the markets come to their senses. Gold should be going up with oil. Oil is black gold. Gold is yellow gold. They should both be going up they normally have more of a positive correlation. Eventually, gold and oil are going to trade in the same direction. And the dollar and bonds are going to trade in the same direction, down. 
the dollar should be falling. And when the dollar is falling, that is going to accelerate this problem. The fact that the dollar is rising is cushioning the blow right now. Things will be a lot worse once the dollar starts to fall, especially for the bond market. Once people start dumping their bonds and their dollars, then we're going to see uh, this slow motion crash turn into a you know normal motion crash. And so far, even the weakness in the stock market is not helping the bond market. You know, imagine all these people that bought bonds because they thought they were going to hedge their stock portfolio with bonds, and they're actually losing more in bonds than in stocks, but they're losing in both. Meanwhile, the economic news is still bad. I mean, look at the data that came out yesterday, the Chicago Fed National Activity Index, minus 0.16. Uh, it was supposed to be plus 0.15, and they revised the prior month down from plus 0.12 to plus 0.07. So weakness, uh, Chicago manufacturing, Dallas Fed manufacturing also down 18.1. Uh, the consensus was down 12 which would have been not as horrible as the down 17.2 from the month before. Instead, it was down even more. Uh, so even more horrible at down 18.1. So we're still getting these weak economic numbers. We got uh, weaker than expected data on uh, new home sales today. And of course, that number is going to continue to get even weaker. Uh, consumer confidence also came in less than expected today. I mean, I still think consumers are overconfident. So that number has a long way to drop. But we have stagflation. I mean, that's where we are. You know, I actually saw some guy from, on CNBC, one of the rare instances where there's somebody that gets something right. This guy was the um, chief economist, I think, or market strategist, rather, at Bank of America. And it sounded like he was basically saying what I've been saying, just not as, you know, dra dramatic as far as, you know, Dr. Doomish. But what he said was true. He said that it's different now. The days of low inflation and low interest rates are over. We're in stagflation. We're going to have rising interest rates, rising inflation, slower economic growth. He said all the stocks that have worked for the last decade are not going to work. Don't buy tech. Don't buy uh, financials. He says bonds won't work either. You're not going to make money in treasuries. He said you got to buy value. you got to buy dividends. You need inflation hedges. He threw out energy as an example, and I agree with him there. But he was talking my book. Everything that I'm putting my clients in, I've been putting them in for a long time because I saw this train wreck coming from a mile away, uh, is value, dividend-paying stocks, inflation head stocks, stocks that do well when, when the economy doesn't, right? stocks that pay dividends that can beat inflation. I Getting out of the U.S., I think, is also a, a paramount concern. He didn't. Uh, mention that, but you got to get out of Dodge and you have to start buying these foreign dividend paying stocks because the dollar's days are numbered. This rally is a head fake. The dollar is going to roll over, I think, and, and, and hard, and then it's going to collapse because the only way to stop the financial crisis, to stop everything from imploding, is to sacrifice the dollar. And that's what the Fed is going to do. At some point, the Fed is going to cry uncle and it's going to surrender in this war against inflation. And everyone's gonna know that inflation won. And that is a game changer because then everybody has to reprice everything for high inflation and gold is gonna be dramatically repriced higher. All US assets are going down. Meanwhile, look at all the other news that is coming. I mean, you got this imminent government shutdown, which in and of itself is not bad news. I mean, I'd actually like it if the government shuts down. Problem is, they don't really shut down. They're, they're still there, right? We still got to pay our taxes. Uh, so, I mean, it's not like they shut down taxes. That's what they should shut down. I mean, maybe if the public knew that during a shutdown, they didn't have to pay any taxes, they'd be rooting for a shutdown, and they wouldn't want the government to start back up again, except the people who get a check from government, well, they, they don't want government to shut down because they want to keep getting the checks. No, all that happens on the shutdown is you can't go to Yellowstone. Right. They take people away from the national parks just so they can have images of people getting there and being told that they can't go in. And little kids are crying. And, oh, you see this government shutdown. It doesn't really shut down. It keeps on operating. It keeps on screwing up the economy just as much during the shutdown. In fact, sometimes the irony of it is when they shut down the national parks, 
they actually have more people working at those parks preventing people from coming in than they have when they're open. So it's the whole thing is ridiculous. If they can afford to send people there to make sure no one goes into the parks, they might as well just open the parks up because it's going to take fewer people. But it's all about PR, you know, to try to put pressure on the politicians from the voters to improve, you know, more spending so they can they can keep the whole thing going. But look at some of the other news. We got these polls out. Again, this is another prediction that, that I, I think I've got right. I've been predicting that Trump uh, was going to rise in the polls. In fact, on a recent podcast, I said you should probably bet him if you're a gambler because the odds, you know, Biden was still a heavy favorite and the Democrats to win the White House. And I said, no, the economy is going to get so bad that there's just I don't see how Biden can get uh, reelected. And the most recent poll has Trump now ahead by like nine or 10 points. I mean, he's way ahead. And Biden's popularity just hit a new uh, low for his presidency, one of the lowest for any president uh, in in modern uh, history. No president has ever been elected to a second term with an approval rating as low as Biden's is right now. But it's going to be even lower by the time uh, the election runs around. And it's not just because he's old. Right. A bit, you know, people think, oh, it's just, you know, Biden's old and people. That's the least of our problems. The reason that Biden is unpopular is because the economy is a disaster. Bidenonomics, whatever that is, is a disaster. You know, I'm watching on, uh, you know, the the network news and they're reporting about uh, Biden's, uh, you know, lack of popularity. And they're, you know, they're basically scratching their heads. They can't figure this out. Like, why is he so unpopular? You know, it's got to be just, you know, his age because the economy is really good. Why is Biden not getting credit for this good economy? You know, why are the voters not giving him the credit that he deserves? Well, he is getting the credit that he deserves because he doesn't deserve any credit. He deserves blame because the economy isn't good. The economy is a disaster, right? It's just that if you're looking at these government statistics that show economic growth and low unemployment, you'd think that we have a great economy. Well, you know, you got to pull your head out from your behind uh, and, and, and throw out those statistics and look at reality. The cost of living is soaring. Prices are rising dramatically. People are hemorrhaging, uh, you know, debt in their homes. They can't afford to go grocery shopping, credit, credit card debt. You know, I'm, re- I'm getting these uh, news stories, you know, how people are trading down. I mean, people can't afford to eat out. And the people who used to eat in expensive restaurants now eat in, you know, fast food restaurants. I, I read an article that something like 30% of people who make 150000 a year are living off their credit cards. Even at 150000 a year, they don't make enough money uh, to pay the bills. Uh, people are struggling with second and third jobs, two full-time jobs. They're, the savings rate has imploded. You know, people are struggling, and that is why Biden is so unpopular. The media doesn't get it. They think that there's some kind of disconnect. Yeah, there is between them. That's the disconnect that you know they don't realize because uh, I guess they make so much more money than the average guy that it hasn't dawned on them just how much the cost of living has gone up. I mean, maybe they have to check with their housekeepers who do the grocery shopping and find out how much people are paying, you know, for, you know, a bunch of bananas, you know, or a loaf of bread or, you know, a gallon of milk or whatever, you know, get some of these prices. Uh, But the, the economy is a disaster. That's why Biden is so unpopular. If the economy was as good as everybody claims, you know, Biden's numbers would reflect that. So this is not some kind of, you know, uh, uh, a paradigm or some kind of conflict like, gee, let's, how can we figure this out? This is a real mystery. Why is Biden not getting the credit? Because there's no credit to get because the economy is not good. And his low poll numbers, these record low numbers is what prove the economy is not good. Meanwhile, we got a strike. We got the auto workers, UAW, out on strike. And now, for the first time ever, the president of the United States has joined the picket lines. Can you imagine that? Join the picket lines? I mean, instead of trying to end the strike, he's like supporting it. He's out there. 
you know, the late, the auto workers. And again, I don't blame these guys for wanting more money because, you know, they're getting killed by the inflation tax. They want a 40% raise and they want a 20% cut in their hours worked. So they want to get paid more to work less. Gee, that sounds pretty good, right? But if you actually think about it, I mean, this is what I'm looking at it. If your work week goes from 40 hours to $32, 32 hours, so you're working 20% fewer hours per week, but you want a 40% increase in what you're being paid, I think that means a 75% increase total because you're you're working less and get and making more so on a per hour basis now maybe that's maybe they've already factored in the reduction in the work week i mean the way i read it it's like they want both they want a 40 percent hike and a 20 percent reduction in work now the 40 percent hike you know they want that spread out over four years so it's it's 10 percent a year but the problem is the automobile companies can't afford to uh to pay especially since they're not going to be able to sell these new cars anymore because the interest on the car loans are too high. Their customers already bought a bunch of cars when they could get cheap loans. In fact, most of these car companies now in America make more money financing the cars than building the cars. But that whole financial model is about to blow up again. And these big bank, you know, these big uh, automobile companies, they're going to go bankrupt. But what is the government doing, right? We got an economic disaster on our hands. The government debt is running out of control, right? We're on the verge of a financial crisis, right? Inflation is running out of control. And what does the government want to do? They want to file an antitrust lawsuit against Amazon. I mean, come on, Amazon? There's Amazon is a monopoly. We got to break them up. I mean, this is what these guys are doing. This is what they're wasting their time on. Look, Amazon is efficient. Amazon is doing a good job. Nobody's complaining about Amazon. Take a look in the mirror. The government has got a $2 trillion deficit. We got $33 trillion in debt, and they want to tell Bezos how to run Amazon? Why don't you figure out how to run the federal government first? Amazon is efficient. Solve the government problems before you start trying to solve a non-existent problem with some kind of Amazon monopoly. Yeah, Amazon is big, I get it. Everybody uses Amazon, why? Because it's cheaper. The public is benefiting from low prices. Now, here we have inflation as a problem, right? You would think that the government would think, oh, well, at least we got Amazon helping to lower prices. No, 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 we wanna to try to screw it up so that Amazon raises prices, so that everything gets even more expensive than it already is. Look, it's the arrogance of these fools in Washington who think they know how to run the economy. They can't even run the government. Get the budget balanced, right? Get your own house in order before you start trying to organize other houses. I've got nothing to worry about. Amazon can't screw me over. They can't force me to go to their website. When I buy stuff on Amazon, it's because it's more convenient to buy it on Amazon. It's because it's less expensive to buy it on Amazon. We buy almost everything on Amazon. I mean, I got Amazon boxes coming to my house in Puerto Rico every day. You know, we run out of cat litter. We don't go to the store to buy it. Just order it on Amazon. Run out of toilet paper, Amazon ships it. Whatever you need, you don't, you don't have to go to the store. It just comes to your house. Uh, and, and, and so the government is saying, oh, we got to stop that? We get, no, eventually, you know, Amazon's going to have problems because, you know, interest rates are going up. The stock is going to have to drop. I mean, eventually Amazon is going to have to raise prices. It's going to happen. But they're not a monopoly. And the government has no business. Look, we got to repeal all these antitrust laws. Clayton Act, Sherman Act, get rid of them. They never should have come about. They've done far more harm than good. In fact, they haven't done any good. They've just done harm. In fact, we should get rid of the entire FTC. We don't need them. You know, one of the things that they point out, if you, you, you could read the... Uh, the complaint against Amazon. But they're claiming that Amazon is colluding and driving up prices because if you want to have a store on Amazon, right? There's a lot of people have their own website and then they also have an Amazon store. And Amazon has a policy that if you have an Amazon store and then you have your own store, that you can't offer a lower price on your store than the one that you offer on Amazon. So the government is saying, you see, they're, they're colluding to keep prices high prices high because they won't let 
these companies offer lower prices. Sure, they, Amazon lets them offer lower prices as long as they're on both websites. What Amazon is saying is you can't use our platform to market yourself and get people to come to your Amazon store and have a product and then say, but you can go to my other site and buy the product cheaper, right? That's what they're trying to stop. And they have every right to do that, right? They, you can't, they're gonna say, you wanna use our platform, great, but make sure that you don't divert the sales that you get from our platform to your other store because you have a lower price there. So Amazon isn't saying you can't lower your prices. They're just saying you have to lower them on Amazon too. You can't create an incentive for people to leave your Amazon store where we make some money and send it to your other store where we don't make any money. There is nothing wrong with what Amazon is doing. There is nothing anti-competitive about what Amazon is doing. And it's none of the government's goddamn business what Amazon is doing. What Amazon is doing is between Amazon and its customers. If the customers are happy, then th that's it. You know, if they're not happy, they leave. And Amazon knows that. Amazon knows that it's got to, you know, keep its customers happy or they'll go someplace else. Uh, and so the government needs to butt out. But of course, they come in and, and who's going to benefit if they bust up Amazon somehow? Not the consumer. Maybe Walmart will benefit. Maybe Target will benefit. It's one of the competitors that will benefit, not, not the consumer. But that's not what the government is supposed to do. The government's not there to give one company an advantage over another. If Amazon achieves some success in the market, then it's entitled to the benefits of that success. And its less efficient competitors shouldn't be allowed to get government to, you know, to step in and, 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 and cripple uh, the other company Right? It's like, hey, here's a company that's really fast and beating us in the races, so that's not fair. So you got to cripple them so that guy is slower so we can catch up. Right? It's like a, an unfair handicap. Uh, and that's not how it's supposed to work. But you got all of this bad stuff um, going on in the economy on top of this impending financial crisis that nobody seems cognizant of. I mean, I don't know. How, how much longer do rates have to go up? How high do they have to go before the markets really buckle, before people start putting two and two together and realizing that this doesn't add up, that the debt service payments uh, will cripple the economy, that the government can't afford to pay, the people can't afford to pay. Of course, the people are the government. If you're an individual, not only are you responsible for your own debt, your own credit card debt, your auto loans, your student loans, your mortgage loans, but every American is on the hook for a share of the national debt. It's not like the government has this debt all to itself. The government doesn't have any resources. It's the public that is obligated to repay the debt. It's our debt. It's not the government's debt. It's our debt. And now, sure, they can print money, but that's the problem. The money they print doesn't have any value. The government doesn't create value, it prints money. The value comes from the private sector. The private sector gives the money the government prints value by producing goods. The government doesn't produce any goods, just prints money to buy goods that the private sector produces. But the government is gonna print a lot more money than the private sector is capable of producing goods. In fact, the government does the opposite. It prints all this money and then it makes it harder for the government, trying to stop this, uh, I forgot to turn my sound off. It makes it harder for the private sector to, to produce the goods and services because the government prints all this money and then has all these taxes and regulation that actually inhibits the productivity of the private sector. So it creates more money to buy stuff and at the same time, it imposes taxes and regulations that limit the, the ability of the free market to produce stuff. So it's, you know, it's a double barrel of inflation and we are headed for a major crash. And that's why you know, people have got to be doing the right thing. Right now, again, people are buying the dollar as a safe haven as they're selling their bonds. It's not a safe haven. It's, it's the epicenter of the problem. The real safe haven would be gold. It's languishing at around 1900. Nobody is buying it. Everybody should be buying it. Everybody will be buying it. 
Uh, you just want to beat them to the punch. And while I'm on the topic of gold, I want to announce that today I agreed uh, to buy back Shift Gold. Uh, years ago, I think it was about seven years ago, I sold the business to Gold Money. Uh, and the reason I did that is because I really wanted to be a part of what, what they were doing, uh, what Roy Sabag and Josh Crom at the time uh, and, and um, uh, James Turk were doing, trying to reintroduce gold as money, right? Have it, it was initially called BitGold, right? And everybody was, it was going to be like PayPal with gold. It was ex exactly what I, I wanted to help. Uh, you know, get people on the gold standard, their per personal gold standard. is what I was trying to do with my bank, but I never got that off the ground. So when I found out about gold money and I met with these guys and, and they had their vision, I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to help make it happen. And so I thought a way that I can take advantage of that was to uh, sell them my gold company and, um, and, and then, you know, just be part of uh, uh, gold money. I got a bunch of stock. I got a bunch of warrants and I was out there promoting gold money. The problem was the regulators wouldn't let it happen. It's not like they just gave up on this dream. The government killed it for good reason, because they hated competition. They imposed such draconian regulations on gold money that it became completely uneconomically feasible to affect these transactions, to make it possible for the average guy to use gold as money. Now, without the government regulations, it was very easy to do. The free market has a perfect solution to enable gold to be used as money. The government is what prevented it from happening. And because of the onerous regulations that were imposed from Canada, not even the United States, from Canada on gold money, they had to give up on everything they wanted to do. And so they, they ended up just being a a company that sold gold and stored it, which you know wasn't anything new or innovative. Uh, a lot of companies did that, but uh, and more recently uh, they've been you know doing some other things with the company. Uh, they've been you know uh, buying real estate and other ways to hedge inflation and find different ways to uh, invest their cash flow and, and build a portfolio. But it seemed like they kind of were were moving in a direction that you know it wasn't something that I really. Uh, you know, was excited to be a part of because it, it, it wasn't the original vision. And I think they looked at Shift Gold because the original reason that I even came to Gold Money was they were more interested in me promoting Gold Money than owning Shift Gold. Shift Gold was kind of just a way to get me in the door so that I can promote Gold Money. Uh, but, you know, since the main thing that I wanted to promote wasn't there and all I was doing was, you know, promoting Shift Gold, which you know, didn't make them that much money in the scheme of things. And there was a lot of regula regulation, you know, because they're a public company. It was expensive, the accounting and the taxes. There was a lot of hassle for them to just hang on to gold, to shift gold. And so uh, we agreed that I would just take the company back. And at this point, you know, we could part friends and they can continue on with uh, their company. And so all I did is we just unwound the transaction because, you know, I got a bunch of stock uh, and I got a bunch of warrants when we did the deal. And I just gave it all back. I just gave back, as I never sold any of the stock. I never exercised any of the warrants. So they just gave me back the company and I gave them back the stock. And, 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 and so now I'm back, or I will be, the owner of Shift Gold. Now, I was always a part of Shift Gold in that I had a marketing agreement with them. Uh, I was still overseeing uh, to make sure that they didn't overcharge customers and that they show, sold the right products. Uh, they maintained the same, you know, sales force that I had when I owned it. Uh, so there was hardly anything changed about the business during the entire seven years that Gold Money owned it. And I was, you know, I was getting paid uh, these marketing fees. So that that's going to end. I'm going to own the company once again. And I'm going to try to take it to another level. I mean, I really see an opportunity, which is a reason that I, I wanted to be back in control of, of this business, because I see explosive demand for gold coming uh, as the world has to come to terms with high inflation as far as the eye can see. Because I don't believe that the government is going to do the right thing. I don't think the government is going to tell the public the truth about higher taxes, lower benefits, that they're going to let banks fail, they're going to let people lose money. I think at the end of the day, they're going to, 
you know, print money. They're going to resort to inflation. That's what corrupt governments have always done. And I don't think that this is going to be any obsession, exception. So we're going to go into an era of extremely high inflation. And Americans are just going to have to get used to it, just like people in Argentina have gotten used to it. Right? They live with it. They've been living with it for a long time. And Americans are about to meet a similar fate. It's not pretty, but that's what we're going to have to live through. But in a area like that, Americans are going to be buying a lot of gold. Uh, and I hope I sell it to them. And I don't want to just sell it to Americans. I want to sell more gold uh, all around the world. Uh, that's part of what I want to uh, do with Shift Gold is, is, is expand it. And by the way, if you've been listening to this podcast, I, I'm sure I'm going to be hiring more people. So send some resumes in uh, to me at, 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 at Shift Radio. Uh, Paul, what's the best email address that we use again for that? People have sent in. All right, jobs, we have that one, jobs at shiftradio.com. But I am going to be hiring uh, for Shift Gold, and especially if you want to come live in Puerto Rico. You know, because, I mean, I'm going to run the business probably from here. Shift Gold is going to stay a U.S. company, but we're going to be doing some work here in Puerto Rico. So if you want to get, you know, a great tax benefit, if you want to be able to work for Shift Gold and hardly pay any income taxes legally, if you're willing to relocate to Puerto Rico, great. If you're not, we still could probably hire you uh, in the U.S. It just won't be as, as, as good a deal for you after tax because you're going to have to pay these uh, higher taxes. Anybody who already has uh, experience uh, in uh, precious metal sales, that is a big plus. I mean, if you've already you're familiar with the products, you've sold precious metals before, uh, you know, that that's a big plus. I definitely want to talk to you. But if you just have general sales experience, but not necessarily in precious metals, but you you understand the story. You understand why people should own gold and silver. Uh, you know, I think everybody connected with the business is going to do really well because this is going to be a huge boom in, in, in gold. And I think by, by rebuying my company, I better position myself as a entrepreneur to profit, not only because I own a lot of gold myself and because I own a lot of gold stocks and I manage a gold fund or I have Adrian Day managing a gold fund, uh, but I'll now own a business again that sells gold. And I hope that my gold business will one day be a much bigger gold business than it is today. And hopefully with all of your help, you know, all my uh, podcast listeners uh, will, who are not currently customers of Shift Gold, hopefully you become customers of Shift Gold in the very near future. Anyway, bye for now and thanks for listening. And again, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to this channel.